The focus of this video is helping you to understand how to approach the new style questions for the um, specification which is going to be examined for the first time in June 2017. The paper begins with a question on immunity. So if a person is bitten by a venomous snake, the immediate treatment is normally to inject the person with the appropriate antibodies. So this would be the appropriate antibodies which were complementary to the snake venom. So they would agglutinate or precipitate the snake venom and therefore prevent it from um, affecting the person who'd been bitten by the snake. So this is an example of which type of immunity? Well, firstly, is it active or is it passive? Well, this is a passive immunity. Active immunity is where you expose the immune system to an antigen. The immune system goes through clonal selection and clonal expansion and produces memory cells so that when you subsequently experience the same antigen, either on the surface of a pathogen or on another vaccine, then you have an immune response where you produce the correct plasma B cells and produce more antibodies more rapidly. So active immunity is exposing the body to the antigen either on the surface of a pathogen or on the surface of vaccine. So this is not active immunity, this is passive immunity. Now you then have two different types of um, passive immunity. You have natural passive and you have artificial passive. Now, natural passive is the passing of antibodies produced by the mother across the placenta to the fetus. So the fetus is born with a passive immunity to conditions that the mother has had recently and produced antibodies against. Now, obviously this is not the case, so the answer here is artificial passive immunity, which is the injection of antibodies which have been made in a third party organism. So the answer here is B. So now what is an operon? So the choices it gives you, it says, is it the binding site for a repressor protein? Well, it has a binding site for a repressor protein, but it is not um, an operon. Any group of genes responsible for the metabolism of lactose in prokaryotes or eukaryotes. Now, this is leading you towards thinking about this, this point B, because you're used to seeing the LAC operon. And the LAC operon is an example or is the model for the action of prokaryotic gene expression. However, this doesn't answer the question what is an operon because an what an operon is is C, which is a cluster of genes under the control of a promoter. Okay, so which statement correctly describes a difference between somatic and germline gene therapy? So somatic cells are the non-sex cells. So they are the normal cells in the whole of your body apart from those cells which produce gametes, which is the germline cells. So germline gene therapy is attempting to augment the faulty cells, which have a faulty gene that produce your gametes, um, and augment those with a non-faulty copy of the correct gene. Somatic cells attempt, somatic gene therapy attempts to do the same thing, but to somatic cells. Now, the example you would have seen with this would have been the treatment of cystic fibrosis or possibly SCID. Um, so the best answer for this one is B that somatic therapy can target specific tissues in need of treatment, whereas germline cells cannot. So the answer here is B. So selection pressure can affect homozygous individuals. The effect can be investigated using a model gene pool. A large gene pool is necessary to ensure that. And the word large should leap out at you because this is the crucial part of the question. A large gene pool is necessary to ensure that, and here we go, 
straight in to see the effect of chance variations in gene frequencies are minimized because the bigger the size of the gene pool, the larger the number of the individuals, the less the chance, the effect of chance variations. So these two organisms show very similar ad anatomical adaptations but are classified in different taxonomic groups. Now, we have a shark which has eyes at the front. It has the same as the dolphin, the mouth at the front. They have fins to steer them. They have a tail to propel them. They have a dorsal fin to maintain their direction. They are a similar shape. The reason for this is they're solving the same problems of how to swim at speed through a fluid whilst looking for something to eat and then eating it. They are totally unrelated. They have a very, very distant common ancestor, but it's a long way back in the past. And the reason why they look the same is because of convergent evolution, because they are solving the same problems of swimming at speed through a fluid whilst finding prey. So the answer here is A, convergent evolution. So this gives you looking at a range of different microscopes and each microscope has a different use. Now select the row that shows the correct uses for all the types of microscope. So firstly, let's eliminate the silly options. So with a light microscope, you do not use it to look at organelles. So you can discard D. Additionally, you don't really use it to look at an object of a certain depth within a cell. It's a bit of a questionable one. With a transmission electron microscope, um, you're going to use that for looking at organelles. With a scanning electron microscope, you're also going to look at, use that for looking at the cell surfaces, because remember it is um, with a scanning electron microscope, you're detecting the electrons that are reflected from the surface. With a laser scanning confocal microscope, you're going to use that to look for an object at a certain depth within the cell. So this gives you an answer of C. So this says the graph below shows the density of two different plant species as the proximity to the coast changes. So you're measuring the density of the species where you've got a distance from the coast and you'd have started off somewhere you know, by the strand line and then you'd have placed quadrats um, every meter, which they appear to have done here, and then measured the density of species A and repeated the process, placing the quadrats every meter and also counted the, the density of species B. So you've definitely not placed them randomly using a random number coordinator because this would, this would random number generator and coordinate tapes because that would have been to compare two different places. Um, the answer here is C, that you've used a belt transect So immobilized enzymes can be produced by which of the following methods? Binding it onto a soluble matrix. Well, if it's soluble, that's not going to immobilize it. Um, intermolecular hydrogen bonding of enzymes is just wibble. Um, absorbing the enzymes onto the surface of the gel, possibly adsorbing, but not absorbing. So absorbing them onto the surface of the gel is not gonna work. And enclosing, them, enclosing the enzymes within a partially permeable membrane is definitely going to work, so it's D. Which of the following statements describes an organelle which is not membrane bound? Well, contains Christi, which is going to be the mitochondrion, that's definitely membrane bound. Modifies and packages proteins, that's the Golgi, lots of membranes. Contains digestive enzymes, well, that could be some lysosomes or peroxy, uh, lysosomes, sorry, or 
finally is made of ribosomal RNA and protein which is a ribosome and that's not membrane bound so that is D. So the graph shows a population of yeast which is a unicellular fungus and a unicellular organism, a paramecium, which is a protist, and that's grown in a fermentation chamber. Um, so we've got a number of organisms here, and we've got time along the bottom, and then we see the yeast population increasing until it reaches this point, and then at that point, the yeast population fluctuates around a level. The paramecium population um, starts off later and increases and then it fluctuates as the yeast population fluctuates as well. So which of the following statements best describes the relationship between the two organisms? So the answer here is D. The two populations are in equilibrium and stable due to a type of negative feedback. So the last um, giant Galapagos tortoise died in 2012. Scientists froze some of the tortoise's cell and here is the last said giant tortoise. So the following statements describe the processes involved in the potential cloning of the um, giant tortoise using the cells. So this is cloning the um, tortoise through somatic cell nuclear transfer. So they're not in the correct order, but they ask you to put them into the correct order. So the first thing you need to do is to get the cell and defrost it. So this has to be, the first point has to be point three. The last point has to be point two, which is the embryo develops into a mature egg, which is incubated. Then we've got to think about what's happening with the donor egg. The donor egg has to be enucleated. That is the removal of the nucleus from the donor egg. And then we have to transfer the somatic cell nucleus into the enucleated oocyte. Then you have electrofusion. Then it transforms, it divides in vitro. And then we incubate it. So the answer here, or the only one which has the correct option, is D. So a number of events occur for a new species to emerge in a population. Which of the following statements correspond to events that are involved in the formation of a new species? Statement 1, gene mutation. Statement 2, selection pressure. Statement 3, a change in the environment. Now, all of these correspond to events that are involved in the formation of a new species. So the answer here is A. So now they give us the diagram represents the general structure of an antibody. So in an antibody, we have the variable region, and the variable region is here. And the variable region is complementary to the antigen, and obviously the antigens vary. Now, then you have a constant region, which is regions two and three, and these are the same in all antibodies. So the question says, which of the following numbered parts of the diagram represent the part of the antibody that has the same sequence of amino acids in all antibodies? And the answer here is C. So the following statements about, are about the structure of DNA. Which of the following statements are true? So a purine base pairs with a pyrimidine base. Well, this is true because remember, adenine and guanine are purines in that they have a double ring in their nitrogenous base and the adenine and guanine well the adenine forms two hydrogen bonds with a thymine which is a pyrimidine and the guanine forms three hydrogen bonds with a cytosine which is again a pyrimidine phosphodiester bonds link adjacent nucleotides well this is correct 
because the bond forms between a phosphate and the next five carbon deoxyribose sugar. So that's the phosphodiester bonds link adjacent nucleotides. Statement three, there are always equal amounts of adenine and guanine. Well, that's not true. There are always equal amounts of adenine and thymine and equal amounts of guanine and cytosine, but there are not always equal amounts of adenine and guanine. So the answer here is B. So deep sea vents on the ocean floor are surrounded by unusual organisms such as chemosynthetic bacteria and eyeless shrimp. So which of the following statements about these ecosystems is or are true? Statement one, that the temperature of the vents influences the organisms that live there. Well, that's definitely true. Statement two, a predatory octopus would affect the balance of these organisms. That's definitely true. And the number of eyeless shrimp found at each vent is constant. Well, that's definitely going to be wrong. So the answer here is B. So this goes on to more on the immune system. So it says there will be outbreaks of new infectious diseases in the future. They will arise from mutations in the genomes of existing organisms. The mutated organisms may not at present be pathogenic or they may be animal pathogens that mutate to be able to infect humans. First question it says is what feature of a pathogen such as mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is the um, bacteria which causes tuberculosis or TB in humans could be altered by a mutation making a vaccine ineffective. So what this is looking for is the concept that a vaccine is exposing your immune system to an antigen that you can then go through clonal selection, clonal expansion and produce uh, B plasma cells which produce the correct antigen which we con correct antibody which will be complementary to the antigen on the surface of the mycobacterium tuberculosis. So having been vaccinated if you then get infected by mycobacterium tuberculosis you will produce the correct antibody very rapidly because you've already got the memory cells. Now what feature could be altered by a mutation might be the feature on the surface of the cell which is the antigen for the receptor that's on the memory cell that you've produced as a result of the vaccination. So what they're looking for you, for you to realize here is that the way vaccines work is that you have an antigen and if that va antigen changes that's on the plasma membrane then the vaccine will be ineffective because you'll have been vaccinated against a different antigen than what is now on the surface of the invading pathogen. So outline the processes that lead to the production of antibodies against an unfamiliar bacterium. So this would be a natural active immunity that's the result of infection by a pathogen. So what they're looking for for this is the standard process of antigen presentation, selection of the appropriate B and T lymphocyte, clonal selection, clonal expansion, and the production of memory cells. So here are they, what they're looking for. So they're looking for the, the B lymphocytes or the B cells have an antigen receptor which is on the surface and it is complementary only to one antigen. There is then clonal selection and then if selected, that B cell will then proliferate. That means divide by mitosis to produce lots of genetically identical B cells, which is why they're called clones. Now they then differentiate into plasma cells and memory cells, and the plasma cells secrete the antibodies, and the antibodies have the complementary um, end of it that is complementary to the antigen. Now on to explain how helper T cells help to speed up these processes and helper T cells remember they are stimulated by the antigen presenting cells and they release 
cytokines which cause an increase in clonal expansion because they cause um, a rapid proliferation of mitosis of the correct B cell clone. So this shows a graph of the concentration of new antibodies in the blood of a person infected for the first time by a pathogen on day zero. So this is the primary response. So what's happened here is that you've been exposed to the antigens here, and then you've gone through clonal selection and clonal expansion over the time of zero to four days. Now that takes time, so initially there are no antibodies. And then having, been, uh, pro having found the correct B lymphocyte that produces the correct antibody, then we get an increase in antibody concentration. It then peaks and then it declines. Now, this says that on day 30, this individual was again infected with the same pathogen. So this is the subsequent experience of the same pathogen for which you will already have produced memory cells. Sketch a line on figure 16.1 to show the antibody concentration from day 30 onwards. So you've got to start at day 30. And because you've already undergone clonal selection and clonal expansion, you will have produced memory cells so that the response will be much faster and much greater. So what the exam board were looking for here is that there should be a higher peak and an in, a steeper initial rise for one mark, that the line should depart the axis between 30 and 33 days, which is earlier than the change here. So it's a shorter period of time. OK, then on to tell us about the theory, why there are the differences between these two graphs. Um, so what they're looking for here is the production of memory cells after the primary response enable a faster um, secondary response. So there are no memory cells in the primary response, that the memory cells remain in the blood after the primary response. So there is no wait for clonal selection because clonal selection had to occur in the primary response but doesn't have to occur in the secondary response because you've already produced the memory cells. So it takes time for an effective vaccine to be prepared in quantity for a new strain of bacteria. So two vulnerable groups, now that word vulnerable must leap out at you, for whom you would advise doctors to prescribe antibiotics although they're not yet showing symptoms of the new disease. So why would they be vulnerable? They're vulnerable because their immune system is poor. So then you've got to think of groups who are weakened or have poor immune systems. So examples you'd pick would be babies or infants, the elderly, anybody who's immunosuppressed. So for example, people taking immunosuppressive drugs because they've had transplants, people who are HIV positive because they have a reduced number of T helper cells, and people who you know have been exposed to the infection, but perhaps have not yet developed the infection. Then goes on to discuss the implications. Now discuss is means you can have a fairly general um, answer to this. So what is the implication of the overuse of the antibiotics? Now remember the, the point here is that antibiotics are a selection pressure and when you've got a population of bacteria, when you've got a bacterial infection, those bacteria vary genetically and when you apply the antibiotic you're applying a selection pressure where you're killing off the bacteria which are unable to survive the presence of the antibiotic so that over time you will lead to the development of a strain of bacteria who are resistant to the antibiotic. So the answers that they're looking for here is that within a bacterial gene pool there will be variation. That those some bacteria will survive the presence of the antibiotic. When you expose it to expose the bacteria to the antibiotic, the most resistant survive, and those surviving bacteria, because they're alive, are able to reproduce, and that those bacteria that reproduce pass on the ability that led them to survive to their offspring. So that over many generations, there's more and more resistant bacteria 
therefore the antibiotic over time becomes ineffective. Now the exam board doesn't expect you to know anything about wild boar or how domesticated pigs are descended from the wild boar. But they do know it. You expect you to know that you have the binomial classification system. And the binomial classification system has genus, which has a capital letter, and then species, which has a lower case, and that you underline it if it is uh, handwritten or that it is italicized if it is typed. So that you know that you've got the sus genus and the scruffo uh, species. Hopefully you also realize that pigs are in the kingdom of Animalia. Otherwise, your years of education will have been somewhat wasted. Now, they ask you then to order the um, levels of taxa, and that goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, or King Philip came over for good sausages. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. So that's your answers there. Additionally, you need to know that the species is Scrophoa and that the kingdom is Animalia and that the genus is Sus. So it now says we now have DNA evidence of how organisms are related to each other. This evidence has helped biologists construct a second classification view, the domain system. And the domain is that there are three domains um, above the five kingdoms. Explain what such developments show about the nature of scientific knowledge. And that, that shows that as, as there is more evidence, as that we improve the technology, that knowledge advances or improves or grows as there is more evidence. They now give you a standard heterozygous dihybrid cross. Um, pretty simple, they give you two alleles. They give you two traits, so you know it's a dihybrid cross. They give you two alleles, one big T which is dominant to little t, and big D which is dominant to the allele for black skin which is little d. They ask you to draw a genetic diagram, so this involves doing a Punnett square, to show the results of crossing pigs that are heterozygous. Now hetero means different, zygous means in the zygote, and they're different for both traits, um, tail and skin. So the parental genotypes are going to be big T, little t, big D, little d, The gametes, remember gametes are produced by meiosis, and meiosis involves halving the number of chromosomes. Now re remember each allele is carried on a chromosome, so when you have a gamete, then you have in one of e either of the two alleles of a gene. So you either have the big T or the little t, you either have the big D or the little d, but you don't have the big T and the little t. So the gametes that you're going to produce, there'll be four different gametes, which will be big T, big D, and then big T, little d, and then little t, big D, and then little t, little d. So those are your four gametes that will be produced in this heterozygous cross from each parent. They then expect you to do a Punnett square. And a Punnett square would involve putting these gametes here and these gametes and the same four gametes down this side. And then fertilizing them to give you the 16 possible genotypes that would result um, from that um, breeding of those two heterozygous parents. 
They then ask you to list the offspring genotypes, list the offspring phenotypes, and then list the phenotypic ratio. Pretty straightforward dihybrid cross that you should be able to do fairly straightforwardly. So the answers to this are, these are the parental genotypes they wanted, these were the gametes they wanted, exactly the same. The offspring genotypes you're gonna get, well, they expect you to list all of them, and then to remember the offspring phenotypes. So these will all show the same phenotype because they have the big T and the little and the big D. So it doesn't matter what that second allele is, they'll all be curly and pink. Now these ones will be um, show the dominant which is the curly and the recessive which is the black because they're homozygous for little d so these ones will show this phenotype these two genotypes will show the straight tail rather than the curly tail and this one will be the straight and the black because it's the double recessive and this gives you a phenotypic ratio of 9 to 3 to 3 to 1, which is the classic dihybrid cross ratio between two heterozygous parents. OK, then it says describe in words how this phenotypic ratio might be different if the two gene genes were autosomally linked. Now, this mean, linked means inherited on the same chromosome and inherited on an autosome, which is a non-sex chromosome. So this is not sex linkage, this is autosomal linkage. So you're looking at a situation where the genes are on the same chromosomes. So you might have this in, on one chromosome and on the other chromosome, you're going to have this. Now, if they're autosomally linked, then they're not going to independently assort. So you're not going to produce the range of gametes that you would um, normally get in this. So the gametes you're not going to get, you're not going to get that gamete and you're not going to get that gamete. You only get those two gametes if there is crossing over between those autosomes. So the answers they were looking for here were that you get a higher proportion, which would be like the parents, because the alleles don't completely um, remix or they don't produce those that range of gametes because they're inherited on the same chromosome. So a pig farmer crossed um, one group of pigs, which are heterozygous for both traits. So it's this with another group, which is homozygous, which are this. Now this is a classic test cross, and this will produce a one to one to one ratio um, of all of the possible phenotypes. So this is what he observed. So he gets 20 of these, 30 of these, 21 of these, and 33 of these. Now he should get a one to one to one ratio. So what he expects is add them all up, divide by four, and he expects 26 of each. Now he hasn't got 26 of each, he's got 20, 30, 21, and 33. So he thinks this is a statistically significant deviation away from the expected ratio, and his answer to this is that he thinks that these two genes are autosomally linked. He thinks there's a big enough deviation away from the expected ratio that it's not explained by normal chance. So he decides to calculate chi-squared to see just how improbable his results are and whether his results are so improbable that they couldn't have been caused by chance, that they must have been caused by autosomal linkage and that his assumption that they independently assort is incorrect. So he calculates chi-squared, which is done this way. So you do O minus E, then you square it, then you do O minus E squared, divide by E, then you add it all up, and this gives us an answer of 4.84, which is sum of O minus E squared over E. So the farmer had concluded that the genes were linked. 
So use your calculation table 17.3 to justify whether the con farm's conclusion can be supported or not. So first thing is how many degrees of freedom have you got? So degrees of freedom is n minus 1, where n is the number of classes. So you have four classes, so you have three degrees of freedom. And then you look for where the p-value um, lies for the value of chi-squared that you've calculated. Now you've calculated a value of chi-squared of 4.84. So you have to look on the row for three degrees of freedom. And the critical value you're looking for is P is less than 0 0.05. And that is 7.81. Now, the value you've worked out is 4.84. Now, this means that the value of chi-squared is not higher than the critical value for P is less than 0 0.05. Therefore, the farmer's conclusion is not supported because the probability is that the deviation away from the expected results is within the boundaries of acceptable chance. Because it's not a statistically significant deviation from what you would expect. So the conclusion cannot be supported because the results are not statistically significant from the expected ratio when you look at it at the 95% probability, which is P is less than 0.05. Milk contains lactose. Lactose is a disaccharide of glucose and galactose joined together by a glycosidic bond. It tells you that lactose cannot be absorbed in the small intestine. The intestinal cells of mammalian infants, so it's not just humans, produce lactase, a enzyme that splits lactose into glucose and galactose. These monosaccharides, which are the glucose and the galactose, can pass into the blood. So this shows a molecule of lactose and the products which are galactose and glucose and what you've done here is you've hydrolyzed the glycosidic bond and the lactase has catalyzed the hydrolysis of that glycosidic bond so the question says suggest why galactose and glucose cannot pass through the plasma membrane into the intestinal cells by simple diffusion and the reason they can't cross by simple diffusion is that they are too large to pass through the phospholipid bilayer, therefore they need to pass through a carrier protein. Um, it then leads on to what substances are required to, what two substances are required to break the glycosidic bond in lactose, and the answer obviously for this is water and the enzyme. So firstly it's too large or not fat soluble, and secondly you need water why are you doing that? Come back, please. Thank you, stressed. Water and lactase. Um, and lactase is the enzyme. So remember, water is to be added to the glycosidic bond. Okay, then it leads on to a gene codes for the production of lactase. This gene is normally switched off after the infant moves to adult food. Almost all adult mammals are unable to digest lactose they are said to be lactose intolerant. So this is all adult mammals. Now humans are an exception that we are not lactose intolerant because most humans have the genetic mutation that prevents the shutdown of the lactase production. So state what structural detail of a polypeptide is altered by gene mutation. So the mutation in the gene would alter the order of amino acids or the sequence of amino acids so they're looking for order or sequence of amino acids is altered by the mutation in a gene now some humans are lactose intolerant so milk can be treated with lactase to reduce the concentration of lactose that's present fresh milk is passed over lactose molecules immobilized on a suitable matrix two economic advantages of immobilizing enzymes for large-scale production. Now remember the importance of <coughs> immobilizing the enzyme is that you're separating the enzyme from the product. Um, you can wash the 
substrate over the enzyme and the product comes out of the bottom and that the enzyme stays bonded to the matrix so that you, therefore you can reuse it so you don't have to replace it. So what they're looking for here was that the enzyme can be reused so less uh, money is expended or there is less cost to supply the new enzymes. Additionally, um, you don't have to purify the enzyme out of the product. So that you save money by um, reducing the downstream processing costs. Also, because immobilized enzymes are more stable at higher temperatures because they're bonded into a matrix so it the tertiary structure doesn't change shape so much as you increase the temperature because the weak bonds don't break because it's held in place by being glued into a matrix or glued into something um, therefore you can run those um, run the, the systems at higher temperatures therefore you'd have more profit from the faster yield So this leads on to a Hardy Weinberg question. They tell you that the mean levels of human lactose intolerance vary in different parts of the world. They then give you the contrasting levels of lactose intolerance in two ethnic groups from different parts of the world. And the two ethnic groups they give you are Australian Aborigines and Europeans. And they give you the frequency of the lactose intolerance phenotype. Now. They tell you in the rest of the question that the lactose intolerance allele is recessive to the mutant allele, which prevents lactose intolerance. So these, this frequency here is the frequency of the double recessive. And the recessive of allele is Q, so that frequency is Q squared. Therefore, Q squared equals 0 0.97. Therefore, in order to work out Q, you have to take the square root of... 0.97 and that gives us a value of 0.9849 when you round it and that is Q. Therefore to work out P, P is equal to therefore 1 minus Q and P is equal to 0.0159 now it says to calculate the frequency of the heterozygous phenotype in the Australian Aboriginal population and the heterozygous phenotype will have the frequency of 2pq therefore you have to take 2 times p times q and this gives us a value of 0 0.03 for the frequency now I am not quite sure how they work out the answer of 0 0.04 uh, anybody has any suggestions then please get in touch right on to the next part of the question so now there's a longer answer question uh, applying evolution and evolutionary concepts and natural selection to the um, allele frequencies that they've stated about lactose intolerance in um, Australian Aborigines and in European populations. So they tell you that mutations preventing lactose intolerance, and remember this is a dominant mutation, um, have occurred in humans at various times in the historic past and in all human races. So it, the mutations have occurred both in Aboriginal Australians and also in um, European populations. They then tell you that the domestication of large lactating animals like goats and cattle arose in Europe and in parts of Africa between five and 10,000 years ago. The lowest levels of lactose intolerance are found in areas that European populations colonized, like North America. The ability of agricultural populations to digest the milk is advantageous. It adds to their general nutrition. So there is a selective advantage if you are a milk consumer to possess the mutation which prevents lactose intolerance and means you are still able to digest the milk. Finally, they tell you that the, Aborigin, uh, the Australian Aborigines have been isolated on their island continent for around 50,000 years. So they're asking you to consider these statements in the context of natural selection. So there's been a mutation, there is a selection pressure, which is that you 
the individuals are consuming um, milk, those that are able to digest the milk are at a selective advantage, therefore they will pass on the allele that led them to be able to digest the milk, therefore the allele frequency for preventing lactose intolerance will become more common in the population. However, the Australian Aborigines are not um, have not had that selection pressure because they haven't been consuming a um, milk-based diet or a diet that possesses milk in it. So there's no selective advantage to possessing that mutation because the mutation which enables you to continue to consume lactose um, won't be at an advantage because they're not consuming the milk. So the question says, suggest how the lactose intolerance phenotype came to be present in only 5% of the population, i.e. 95% of the population are able to tolerate lactose, but came to be present in 97% of the Australian Aborigines, therefore only 3% of them um, do have the mutant lactose toleratingness. Use the information given above and knowledge of Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection. So let's have a look at what they suggest. They suggest that you should consider the points that Europeans have a genetic variation which included the mutant non-intolerance allele. Because there was milk, and because those societies consumed milk as part of their diet, therefore was a, there was a positive selection pressure for the individuals who possessed the mutant allele. Because they had a better chance of survival because they had better nutrition. Therefore, there was directional selection to increase the allele frequency. Therefore, the mutant or non-tolerating allele accumulated in the gene pool. There could have been genetic drift in small historic populations. The allele is dominant, so it's expressed in the heterozygote individuals, therefore it would increase the frequency of in the phenotype. And comparing it with the Australian Aborigines, that the ancestral population um, is pre-agricultural, that they don't have cattle or goats, um, they don't um, have domesticated cattle or goats, there's no selection for the mutant uh, allele because the mammals to domesticate aren't present. It's an island, so there, are, so the, there is no way that those suitable mammals can come across. There's no contact with other non-Aboriginal peoples because Australia is an island. There's no gene flow from other human populations. There's no selection pressure um, to increase the allele frequency because there's no consumption of milk, therefore there's no advantage to possessing that allele which enables you to tolerate the um, lactose, therefore there's no selection pressure to increase the mutant non-tolerating allele. Okay, on to the next. So a patient has been coughing blood and it is suspected the bacteria will be found in the blood. The medical technician cultures the blood on an agar plate. This is in order to find the bacteria which are present in the blood. Um, what measures should the technician take to keep the agar plate culture sterile? That is sterile from um, contaminated organisms. So what they were looking for here was that you could, should work in an inoculating cabinet, that you should reduce the time that the plate is open, that you should flame the inoculating loop, or that you should use the, um, the sterile pipette, and that you should seal the plates for incubation. Now, what they don't award credit for was these bits here, which was um, any questions about the safety of the um, technician, and any questions about auto, sorry, any statements about autoclaving or irradiating, because that would all be done before you got the sample. So it's all what the technician should do after they got the sample. So tissue traces from a crime scene often need to be identified. DNA from the tissue is amplified by the PCR, the polypolymerase chain reaction, to get samples large enough for further analysis. 
Modern PCR uses DNA polymerase um, from the bacterium Thermus aquaticus. So why is this enzyme chosen? Well, remember that um, PCR requires a cycle of heating, so you heat to 95 degrees to melt the hydrogen bonds between the two strands of DNA. You then cool it to 55 to allow the primers to anneal and the um, DNA polymerase from the thermos aquaticus, also known as the TAC polymerase. Um, then you heat to 72 to enable the extension um, and the making of the new strands. So the reason why you want to use the um, polymerase from Thermos aquaticus is that it's a thermally stable enzyme, that it survives the heating to 95 degrees, which means that you can keep cycling um, and keep cycling the experiment to keep increasing the quantity of DNA that's present. So the marks were for the reason that it was thermal, thermally stable, it doesn't denature at 95 degrees, and the reason for that is that you can keep repeatedly cycling it without stopping to add more enzyme, which is what you'd have to do if you were using an enzyme that wasn't thermally stable, because you'd have denatured it by heating it to 95 degrees. Okay, so valine, citrulline, um, hydroxyproline, and glutamic acids are amino acids that are normally found in considerable amounts in your urine. Following certain diets can result in change in the amino acid um, present in the urine of some people. Plan a method to compare. Now, compare is crucial. The amino acids present in the urine of a person who has been following one of these diets with that of a person who has not. Now, compare means that you need to carry out this process on one person who has been following that diet and you're comparing the composition of those amino acids present in the urine with the person who has not been following the diet. Now the way that you could compare the amino acids present would be to carry out chromatography. So they are expecting you to say that you'd carry out chromatography and that you would then um, do the blots of the two urine samples that you'd separate them with a solvent, the solvent rising up the paper. You would use a stain to visualize the spot, seeing where the amino acids were on the chromatography paper. And then you would compare the patterns of where those spots were on the chromatography paper between the two individuals that had been following the diet or not following the diet. So the European cork borer moth is a pest of agriculture. Its larvae develop inside maize stems and eat the contents. Now this becomes crucial for the last part of the question. So the fact that it develops inside is important and that word should leap out and you think, well, why have they told me that? Um, the bacterium Bacillus thuringiensis Bt produces a protein that poisons the larvae of moths and butterflies. This protein can be isolated from cultures and packaged in fluids to be sprayed on the surface of the plants. Now remember they've told you that the larvae develop inside the maize stems and eat the contents. The gene modifying for the plant, the toxic protein has also been isolated, been incorporated into a genetically modified strain of maize called Bt corn. This makes the plant tissues poisonous so the tissues are poisonous to the corn borer moth. Then it asks you to consider the statement that genetically modified plants and animals should be classed as new species. Outline one experiment or investigation that could provide evidence to support or contradict the statement. Now remember the biological um, species concept that a species is unable to interbreed with another species producing fertile offspring. So an experiment that you could um, suggest for this would be to breed the genetically modified plants or the genetic modified animals with the unmodified animals or plants and see if they produce a um, fertile offspring or not. So answers that they were looking for here were 
If you looked along the lines of fertility, you could breed the GM stock with a non-modified stock and see if the offspring were fertile. And if the offspring were fertile, they would not be classed um, as being different species, they would be classed as being members of the same species. This is the primary bit that the examiner was expecting you to put, and that gives you three marks if you explain it properly. However, other things that you could have gone on to discuss was to compare the morphology, compare the ecology, or compare the genetics. And if you came out with three recent points for those, then they would also additionally give you the marks. Now, a farmer which wants to increase the yield of maize a friend recommends planting genetically modified Bt corn as it would be more effective than against the European corn borer larvae rather than spraying unmodified corn with the Bt toxin. Now remember that in the preamble to the question they very clearly told you that the larvae developed inside the maize stems and eat the contents and that the um, Bt toxin that you would package into a fluid would be sprayed on the surface of the plant. They then tell you that the genetically modified Bt corn has the plant tissues are poisonous. So the friend who is advising the farmer is correct in that um, growing the Bt corn would be more effective than spraying the unmodified corn with Bt toxin. And the answer for that would be that the spray may not reach all of the larvae because the larvae are inside the plant stem and are shielded from the spray. So you do need to justify the answer. It's not sufficient to say that you would um, recommend using the genetically modified Bt corn. You must justify it by saying the spray would not reach the larvae. Whereas if they use the Bt corn, then um, the, would be produced, the toxic protein would be produced by the tissues of the plant and would kill the larvae. So the next question is an essay question looking at your ability to um, think about validity and accuracy um, and improvements. So they tell you that some students investigated the different ways of protecting the maize plants against the corn borer moth. So they in each of three separate but close together square plots in the same field, they planted several hundred maize seedlings. Plot A was untreated, plot B was sprayed daily with the toxin, and plot C were the genetically modified Bt corn. Now on the first day of each week, one student would walk around the edge of a plot and count the number of maize plants that had collapsed in the plot, assuming that the collapse of those plants is due to the action of the corn borer. Each plot had a student responsible for counting, so maybe a different student. The results are shown in the table. So if we look at those results, they give you the number that have collapsed since the last weekly count. And plot A, you can see that lots of them collapse. Plot B, lots of them don't collapse until about week 11, then more of them collapse. And then plot C, which is the um, genetically modified crop, um, comparatively few of them collapse. Now, the student's tutor raised a number of concerns about the investigation. Were they a valid test of what was being investigated? Were the results accurate? And some variables were not controlled. So it then says explain why these concerns are justified and then suggest improvements to the investigation. So changes that could be made to the investigation to address those concerns. Is it a valid test? Are the results accurate? And which variables were, were not controlled? So you have to approach all three of these in your answer. So before we look at what you could have written, um, let's look at the uh, format and the context that the examiner wants. So they want a complete investigation detailing the objections for reliability, accuracy and control. Now you have to address all three of these in order to put yourself into level three. If you miss out any of the three, validity, accuracy and control, then you are down into level two. So you do have to put points addressing each of those three. You need to evaluate the data 
and then evaluate the procedures and then provide re refinements that address all of the significant issues concerned. For level two, if you address it, address partly some of the concerns or you give objections and improvements for all of the teacher's concerns but it's a partial explanation and you look at a range of the aspects of the data of the procedures um, in sound but not comprehensive refinements. For this one you know, there needs to be a line of reasoning presenting presented with some structure, the information presented is in most part relevant and supported by some evidence. Whereas to be in level two, you need a well-developed line of reasoning which is clear and logically structured, it is relevant and substantiated. So let's look at some of the points you could have raised. So arguments about the validity. So is it valid? Well the objections could be that there's no, um, you don't know what the cause of the collapse is. That they, the plants may have collapsed for different reasons. And the number that have collapsed is less meaningful than the percentage of plants that are growing in that plot because the, the number of plants may vary um, those plants which have germinated and grown in each plot. So the improvements that you could um, would suggest to uh, address the validity would why each plant has collapsed, um, you could dissect the stems, you could use the percentage that have collapsed out of the original. Looking at accuracy, um, the objections might be here that the collapsed plant may have been counted twice from the edge. Some collapsed plants, collapsed plants may not have been noticed if they were inside the middle of the plot and the students may have counted differently from each other because you've got a different student counting plot A, plot B and plot C. So improvements that they suggest is remove the collapsed plants so you don't count them twice. Uh, use narrow strips as plots so that you're not missing the ones in the middle. Have all the plots counted by the same student. Have more than one plot student counting and then average the counts produced by the two different students or three different students. And finally looking at the variables that weren't controlled. Um, if ever you're looking at a the growth of a um, biological organism then you've got to remember that all things in biology vary. So unless they are clones, there will be natural variations in the plants but in their level of susceptibility to the corn borer. Um, that there'll be genetic variations between the Bt and the regular corn, so you're not comparing like with like. So the improvements that they suggest is clone the plants so that the plants are genetically identical in each plot so that you know that they have the same level of su susceptibility to <coughs> the Bt corn borer, no, B to the corn borer, sorry, and then perform the genetic modification to Bt on the same clones as used for other plots. So the only difference between those, uh, between the plants you use, is that some have that um, gene for producing the Bt toxin and others don't. Then leads on to many plants can produce natural clones of themselves. Gardeners and farmers take advantage of this by taking cuttings. When a genetically modified plant is created, it may be cloned into many plantlets by the process called micropropagation. Compare the equipment and techniques of taking cuttings with those used for micropropagation. So if it's compare, you need to make a comparative statement. It's not sufficient just to talk all about micropropagation. You have to compare it with the process of taking cuttings. And what they were looking for here was that cutting needs less equipment and micropropagation needs more equipment and also a more skillful staff, which is therefore more expensive. And micropropagation produces more cloned offspring than the taking of cuttings. So now we look at a food chain in 
the um, Antarctic Ocean. So they give you a food chain which goes the phytoplankton, which are the autotrophs being consumed by the primary consumers, which are the krill, and then by the small fish to the large fish to the seals, which are large mammals. Um, they give you a table that shows the transfers of energy and the quantity of energy stored as biomasses for the food chain. Kilojoules per metre squared of sea surface area per year. Per metre squared, this becomes very important later. Now, for larger and less numerous organisms such as the seal, it's more appropriate to record the energy flows per square kilometre. So calculate the energy input to the seal population from large fish. Record your answer in kilojoules per square kilometre of sea surface. Now a square kilometre is a thousand metres by a thousand metres. So you have to multiply your answer that you get in kilojoules per metre squared by a million to give you the answer in kilojoules per kilometre squared. And the energy inputs that are going to be into the seal are going to be that the energy converted into biomass by the large fish is then going to be consumed by the seals however this much biomass is not um, is going to be lost to other consumers or to decomposers so the answer here is going to be 0 0.2 minus 0 0.09 which gives us 0 0.11, that is kilojoules per meter squared per year. So therefore you have to then multiply that by a million in order to, which is converting meters into um, number of meters in a square kilometer. And that gives you 110,000 kilojoules per kilometer squared per year. So the answer here is 110,000 kilojoules per kilometre squared per year. And you do have to put the units in to um, get the second mark. Calculate the percentage of energy stored in large fish biomass converted to energy in the seal biomass. Well, looking up here, the large fish biomass is 0.2 and the seal biomass is 0 0.05 so you have to do 0 0.05 divide by 0 0.2 which gives you 0 0.25 multiplied by 100 to give you 25 percent the answer again is 25 percent So the biomass of large fish in the Southern Ocean is a food resource for humans. It's increasingly harvested by large, powerful, long-distance trawlers. If overexploited, the Southern Ocean ecosystem may be permanently altered. Suggest so two measures that an international treaty might impose to prevent fishing from causing permanent damage to the Southern Ocean. And then identify the practical difficulties that might prevent your two measures from being effective. So what they were looking for here was that you may wish to impose fishing quotas. You may wish to impose regulations on mesh size, on the restriction that species, which species can be caught, that the number of days could, at sea could be regulated, that you would need to impose sanctions that have monitoring, and you might have public education to um, inform people about the problems of consuming those fish taken from the Southern Ocean. Now, the difficulties that you might wish to link to your measures would be that the area that you're monitoring is too large, that there is an huge expense of monitoring, that monitoring is hampered by weather, and that there could be false reporting and the, um, of by the catches of the trawlers and by the mesh size, etc. Then it says krill can also be harvested as a human food source. The fishing industry aims to harvest large fish. Some environmentalists say that krill harvesting should be increased. Use this information and the table to put forward arguments for and against the harvesting of krill in instead of large fish as a human 
food source. Now the table um, about the energy flow through the ecosystem, well that you need to use and you need to use it reasonably thoughtfully because you need to talk about the energy that's in the large fish whereas the compared to the energy in the krill. We would get a hundred times more kilojoules per meter squared from the krill than from the large fish because remember there are energy losses between each trophic level. So this question is asking you to think about the nature of uh, energy flow through ecosystems and the fact that large amounts of energy are lost due to the respiration of the organisms and that only about 10% of the energy is passed on between each trophic level. So those are the arguments for is that it would be more efficient in terms of the energy you wish to obtain to eat the krill rather than eating the fish which have eaten the small fish which have eaten the krill and there would be big losses between each trophic level. The arguments against that um, you would need a big change into the fishing industry and to consumer habits or it would impact the ecosystem at the first trophic level and then impact all subsequent members of that um, food chain. A small permanent pond is the habitat for a climax community of producers and consumers. Now they tell you it's a permanent pond. So why might ecologists call this a climax community? So this is asking you to explain the definition of a climax community. So what they were looking for here was that the community that's present in the pond is the final community or is stable or is not subject to further succession and succession remember is the composition of the community which changes over time um, but this is a small permanent pond so this would be a climax community so the protoctist paramecium chordatum is usually between 200 and 300 micrometers in length and remember a micrometer is a thousandth of a millimeter so this is 0 0.2 millimeters to 0 0.3 millimeters in length an accurate measurement would help in the correct identification of a specimen from this pond. What laboratory equipment would you select to make an accurate measurement of the length? Well, it's pretty small, so you need to make it a bit bigger. So the first step you need to make is to use a light microscope. On the light microscope, you should have um, etchings, and those etchings will be on the eyepiece, on the eyepiece, and it will be formed an eyepiece graticle. So you'll be able to line up the paramecium with the eyepiece graticle and measure the length of the paramecium chordatum. Next, an animal fell, in, fell into the pond, it drowned and decayed. Within a year, the biological compounds in its body had been completely recycled. And remember, the biological com compounds that contain nitrogen will be the proteins, the DNA and the RNA. So what nitrogenous excretory molecule from the decomposers would pass to the next stage of the nit nitrogen cycle? So this is a molecule that's been made from the decomposers breaking down the um, corpse of the dead animal. And what they were looking for here was a suggestion that it would be urea or uric acid. Finally, complete the flow chart to show what happens to this nitrogenous compound and name the groups of bacteria involved at the steps one and two as it's converted to a form that the plant can take up and use. So the form that the plant can take up and use is as nitrate. Now, the steps that um, occur here are that, first of all, you have the action of nitrosomonas, and nitrosomonas takes um, the urea or ammonia or uric acid and turns that into nitrite. Nitrite, which is NO2, is then consumed by the nitrobacter genus of bacteria and that nitrobacter genus produce nitrate and those are taken up by the plants. So thank you very much for getting to the end and well done and good luck with your exams.